the igniter to this offense at the top of the order when they went to the World Series. In fact, they hit a game winning home run, was a World Series hero in one of the games against the Astros. He's been bothered by injuries, hamstring, shoulder, finger, broken fingers, and in and out of the lineup. Last year, Reds fans will remember he was in Colorado. Released by Colorado at the end of spring training, signed back with the White Sox. They sent him to Triple A, and he's back at the major league level. And as you can see, last 10 games, he's hitting 326 for the month of June. He's over 300 at 304. So Pacetnik leads it off, followed by Alexei Ramirez and then Jermaine Dye. Pacetnik has faced a Royal before. He's three for four against him. That young man in the on deck circle, something else. Electric hands, electric feet. Alexei Ramirez brilliant last year as a second baseman and now he's moved back to his normal position of shortstop. Did you just see Scott Pesednik jump up in the batter's yep. box? Mid When's the last time you saw that? <laughs> Try to shoot the ball to the left. He takes a breaking ball that misses says the home plate umpire Chad Fairchild calls ball four. Here's your four defensive alignment for the Reds. The Reds 13th in the National League in defense with 48 errors. That's four more errors than the White Sox have coming in. Nix, Dickerson, Bruce in the outfield. Lineup changed just before the game. Paul Yanish replaced Alex Gonzalez at short. Gonzalez had a twinge in his elbow. He took batting practice, was out on the field, and it was only about 10 minutes ago that they scratched him from the lineup. So Yanish gets the start at short. And here's Ramirez. In a 254, seven homers, 30 knocked in. You got to be cognizant of Pacetnik down at first. He's got nine stolen bases, been caught three times, and for his career, he's over a 75% stolen base threat. And he's got a pretty good lead down there. Ramirez and Pacetnik represent the real speed burners in this lineup. Breaking ball, that misses. And it's a ball and a strike. Bronson overall now three games over 500, 78 and 75 for his major league record here at Great American Ballpark. Seven games over 500, 23 and 16. Takes a little off way out in front as Ramirez, and that's the way you got to deal to this kid, Chris. He'll hit a fastball a mile. Well, George, he's got great plate coverage, and that's the one thing about Ramirez. So what you can do there is you you speed up and slow down his game rather than try to move the ball in and out and up and down. He looks skinny boy but he puts the bat on the ball and has some kind of big time power and wow. to all fields too. Twenty seven years of age out of Cuba. Well, he led the Cuban League in home runs the last time he was in that of course he defected from Cuba just a couple of years ago became a resident of the Dominican Republic so he could negotiate and sign and he ended up signing with the White Sox because Kenny Williams their general manager really hotly pursued him. They love his baseball skills. I mean, he's got tremendous arm from shortstop. He's got a great glove, but he's still learning the major league game. They've got him locked into a four year deal. Till 2011. When you called him about representing him, you couldn't get through, huh? He was already talking to Jesse <laughs> about something in the trunk of Jesse's car. That's it. <laughs> One ball, two strikes, runner not going. This one popped in the right. Long run. Will anybody get there? Here comes Bruce at the foul line. It is in the seats. Long run for Phillips and Bruce. George, you were talking about a minute ago how the running game is so much of the game for Scott Pesednik. You can say the same for the guy in the batter's box, Alessi Ramirez, and also down the batting order when you get down to Chris Getz. Actually, the running game is more important to the White Sox than the running game is important to the Reds. They've got more overall team speed than do the Reds, but the good thing is that the Reds catchers have really shut down the running game of opposition so far this year, especially this combination of Arroyo and Hannigan. One ball, two strikes, but Sednik not going. Swing and a miss. There's a strike, and there's an out. Strikeout number one for Bronson. One out, one on. Here's another look. Oh, you know, you get a feel for what is going to work on certain hitters, even though you may not know them. And you got to figure that after that first horrible swing on a slow curveball that Ramirez made, that they're going to go back to that eventually. If they could just get two strikes on that kid, they start pulling the string. So Ramirez strikes out. First out of the inning, here's Jermaine Dye. Dye at 270. 15 homers, 39 knocked in. Dye's the big thumper in this lineup. 
You know they have Jim Tome, but with a designated hitter rule in effect, they can only play one, either Tome or Canerco. So Canerco's playing at first. Carlos Quentin out. He's been out since the end of May with the foot injury. There's the guy who's heading to 600 home runs. Jim Tome, brilliant, big time power hitter. No balls, one strike. On the corner for a strike. And we talked a lot about it, Chris, all the way up till the end of the year last year. And you and I talk on the phone, and all the rumors all winter long. And even at the Reds Fest, we talked about it. It looked like this guy was going to be a Red, Jermaine Dye. The talks between Kenny Williams and the Reds general manager, Walt Jockety, it never did materialize. Well, it never really got formalized, George, but they got very long way down the road in that. In fact, they had uh, agreed on players. The only thing they had not agreed on between the Reds and the White Sox was how much money would be shared by the Reds and the White Sox. I think from what I understand, uh, the Reds wanted the White Sox to bear some of the salary that Jermaine Dye is making this year. And the White Sox say, you know what? When we trade guys, we don't need any of that salary. Last thing we want to do is pay somebody to have them come back and play against us. So that was the end of the discussion. He's making eleven and a half million dollars this year. One ball, two strikes. And even Jermaine said the same thing. He said, I thought it was signed, sealed, and delivered. I thought I'd be swinging for the fences in Great American Ballpark, which he, is not a bad place to swing for. You would not have to, have to swing so hard here. <laughs> There's the manager of the White Sox, Ozzie Guillen, who was the rookie of the year as a Chicago shortstop back in 85 and who grew up as a fan of the Reds in Venezuela. Always wore number 13 in honor of Davy Concepcion. And when he first came up from the minor leagues, if you asked him, what do you know about the big red machine? He'd rattle off the starting lineup of the big red machine. He'd rather rattle off how many positions Pete Rose played, and he'd rattle off what Davey did. <laughs> Gian saying that's all he's going to do is throw over to first, or we're all going to fall asleep. Huh? That's Ozzy. You know, he, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He'll say what he, you know, sometimes it can be embarrassing to players, sometimes it can be irritating, but he'll say what's on his mind. And he really doesn't care who's within earshot. Nope. An infectious smile. <laughs> and he'll say a few things that'll get himself in trouble from time to time. Yep. Two balls, two strikes. Count even. We'll see if Pitsetting might be off and running here. Not going. And he gets him with an off speed pitch again. Back to back strikeouts. Two away. And here comes Canerco. Well, you know, sometimes a pitcher has to use his whole bag of tricks early in the ball game, and that's what it seems like Arroyo's got to do. Ideally, a pitcher would go through the lineup the first time using, say, only fastballs or only curveballs or only four seamers. But the more that those White Sox foul the ball off and they're patient at the plate, they're going to make Arroyo work. And he's been able to get him out, but he's had to use his whole bag of tricks so far to do it. Here's Canerco. Ball at 291, eight homers, 41 knocked in. Speaking of ties to the Reds, he was a Red. Came over from the Dodgers in a trade that sent Jeff Shaw, the closer, from Cincinnati to Los Angeles. That was right after Jim Bowden <laughs> promised Jeff Shaw he wasn't getting traded. And he also promised Canerco that he'd be with the Reds a long time. He was gone after a month. <laughs> he was traded that winter. After spending September with the Reds, he went to Indianapolis and then went to join the Reds in September and was traded. There goes Pitsetnik. Here comes the throw. He's going to be safe. He got a big break on Arroyo. So there's the tenth stolen base for Pitsetnik. Well, with two outs, the pitcher doesn't really pay quite as much attention to that runner at first base as earlier in the inning. And Pitsetnik got a sneakily got a little bit bigger lead, got a good jump that time. Hannigan never really had a shot. Well, Chris, the other part of the Canerco story was, of course, the Reds at that time had Sean Casey. And uh, the idea was that Casey was going to be the first baseman. And where would Canerco play? They found out he couldn't play third, so they traded him to the White Sox for Mike Cameron. And it was a brilliant trade because Cameron really solidified center field for the Reds in 99. You know, George, the one thing that we never did see that I always wanted to see to see that, yes, that race, the sprint right. race between <laughs> Canerco and Casey. We built that, didn't we? We never got to see it. He wasn't, we were going to do it in spring training. I had the sundial ready to go. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Not the Kentucky Derby, the most exciting two minutes in sports, them running around the bases together. And they were going to do it, too. 
I mean, Case and uh, Canerco said that they would race. We were waiting the spring training, and lo and behold, spring training came, and Canerco was in Chicago. <laughs> he can sure hit. Make no mistake about that. He needs two more runs batted in for his career. He'll have 1,000 for his career. One ball, two strikes. But set Nick good speed off second. <laughs> it's funny. That's the first thing I thought of when I saw him today, too. The race <laughs> that never came. <laughs> what a fine young man, though. He, his first road trip with the Reds, he went back home to Arizona where he lived and hit a home run his first game in Arizona. And it was a memorable day for him. Fouled off. Count stays at one and two. We talk often about Bronson Arroyo pitching backwards, and I think you even touched on it, Chris. He, very often he'll start off throwing fastballs. He may pitch backwards today if he survives early and end up after using a lot of breaking balls early, using the hard stuff later. Well, you know what? He's he's a good observer, and what he's observed lately from the Reds is not much of an offense. And he knows that he can't afford to give up a lot of runs early. Maybe not even one or two runs to a pitcher like Jose Contreras, who's throwing the ball so well. That's why he's being so careful out there in the first inning. Two balls, two strikes. You know, we had Aaron Harang on the other night during the broadcast. George interviewed him, and we asked him about pitching for a team that was so offensively challenged. He said, you know, last year he let it get to him. This year he's let it go a little bit, realizing he can only do what he can do. But still in all, you still realize that as a pitcher. You know that your team is struggling a little bit offensively. And you just don't want to get them behind early. And that's why Arroyo's really slowed the pace down right here to make sure that he can make the pitches that he wants. That is a weak ground ball to second. Phillips will gobble it up, and that'll do it. So a leadoff walk, no harm. Arroyo gets out of trouble. Let's go to work. Dickerson, Harrison, Phillips do up. Phillips at home over 300 overall he's at 279 Lance next whose brother Jason plays for the White Sox will hit fourth Ramon Hernandez will be back at first again Bruce Hannigan Giannis who takes over for Gonzalez who is a late scratch with a twinge in his elbow and Bronson Arroyo the pitcher bats in the number nine spot talk about a guy who's on a roll Jose Contreras sure is even if it's a roll of only two ball games he came back from Achilles tendon surgery blew it out last August everybody thought well he's not going to be ready until 2009 sometimes midseason guess what he showed up in spring training and he said I'm ready to go they ran him through drills they pitched him and he got off to a horrible start that's why his earned run average is so high but his last two games he has been lights out Sean Bunn is Dickerson. He dumps it down. The bare hand throw won't be nearly in time. And going to second will be Dickerson. Down the right field line into the corner. Die will scoop it up. And just like that, the Reds have a runner in scoring position. A bunt base hit and an error on the rookie, Gordon Beckham. 
Beckham came up as a shortstop. They have him playing third, and the Reds pick his pocket. Yeah, this is a new position for Beckham, but he's playing awfully deep there anyway. They had him over to shift, but they didn't really come in to take the bunt away because Dickerson has not been leading off that much. Remember, Tavares has, so he kind of drops a sneak attack on him, forces an error, and the Reds have something cooking right away. And just as you talked about Bronson Arroyo knowing how difficult it is to get runs the runs the Reds know how difficult it is it's been to get runs off Contreras so they're going to try everything they can to squeak across a run here or there and here comes Harris to Jerry in at 239 seven homers 19 knocked in his job get the ball at the very least to the right side get the runner to third. Joe and Bunt he gets it to the right side that'll get the runner to third. They just do get him by half a step. So a sacrifice one to three. And a little ball working for the Reds. Get him on, get him over, get him in. They've got two thirds of that done. Here's your four defensive alignment for the White Sox. White Sox 11th in the American League with 44 errors. But Sednick and Anderson, both center fielders, and die and right good arm. Back of a normal shortstop play in third. Ramirez, who played second last year, is back to his normal spot short. Gets good speed at second. Konerko, sometimes a DH, the first baseman here. And Ramon Castro was a late acquisition to the White Sox behind the plate. A.J. Pruszynski, of course, the other catcher with the White Sox. Here's Brandon Phillips at 279. Ten homers, 43 knocked in. The Reds, second baseman digging in, and the White Sox will bring the infield in with one out and a runner at third. One and one. Brandon leads the club and runs batted in with the lengthy absence from the lineup of Joey Votto. His 43 is number one. Trying to pick one up here. You can see him try to lift that ball in the air to get a sacrifice fly out of this at bat. And that's not an easy thing to do against Contreras. He throws a heavy sinking fastball. Boy, that just pours in on your hands. And Chris, that description is, you know, some guys throw fast. But some guys just throw a hard ball. It feels like you're hitting a brick when you hit it, and that's Contreras. You know, George, and I'd like to get a physicist or some kind of scientist to help me understand what exactly that means. But you're, I mean, that's exactly right. You've played catch with guys that it feels like you're throwing a shot put, and other guys feel like you're throwing a ping pong ball. Contreras is the shot put variety, and he throws it from all angles. Castro wants the ball up. It's up out of the strike zone, and it's two and two. Missing will go full three and two. Contreras last two starts two and zero oh, an ERA of zero zero zero. Well, he really sticks that ball right between his index finger and his middle finger. In fact, when he goes down the bullpen to warm up, he takes three different sizes of softball down there with him so he can stretch those fingers apart and, and make it feel more and more likable to him. Dribbler to the right side. They'll shovel it over. The runner will hold, so there's two away. Phillips unable to get the run in. Sitting at third is Dickerson, and here comes Lance Nix. Four to three is the put out for the second out of the inning. You see one Nix, Jason Nix, in the White Sox dugout. Looking at his brother, this is special time for that family because of the age difference. They've never been able to play on the same team and very rarely have been able to be on the same field together. Lance Nix of the Reds was a not an early favorite, but a wild card favorite to make the Reds team. Jason Nix, his brother, his younger brother, was a favorite to make his ball club, but he went on the disabled list with an injury. Didn't come back until the end of April. So they're both looking with pride at each other in this three game series. Lance in at 257, seven homers, 21 knocked in. Jason, smart kid, Chris. He's sitting talking next to Jim Tomey. He's got more hair than his brother. <laughs> that 
breaking ball just misses one and one. I'll tell you, the more you get to know Lance Nix, the more you like the young man, though, George. And I'm sure Jason's the same way. Good family, good solid people. Look you in the eye when you talk to him. I don't know about Jason, but I'm not sure anybody on his ball club works harder than Lance. Uh, Jason's out of the same mold. He was on our USA Baseball National Team and was one of the most highly regarded competitors on that club. I mean, you talk to Paul Siler, the president of USA Baseball, just rave reviews. Now, let's we ought to preface this by saying if you sit next to Jim Tome, you have to talk because he's like Casey. He'll talk from uh, sunrise to sunset. He's got some forearms, doesn't he? Just like his brother. <laughs> yeah. Mom and Pop can be proud of those two. That's Pop foul and out of play. Must be feeding him a lot of spinach in the Knicks household. Does look a little like Popeye, doesn't he? Lance has the head start on the beard, though. No mistake about that. It's going to take Jason a while. Jason's got a bigger chew, though. He can drop that anytime. Yep. One ball, two strikes. Lance trying to shorten up and find a way to get a run in. Red started the inning great. Dickerson a bunt hit an error by the third baseman Beckham. He went to second. Harrison sacrificed him to third, but Phillips grounded out, and now it's one and two to Lance. Knicks. Ramon Hernandez on deck. Lofted in the air. Here's Pitsednik. He's got it. The Reds strand a runner. Well, in the first inning, at least, 0 for 3 with a runner in scoring position. Batting leadoff this year, over 260, a homer, two knocked in. He's got three stolen bases, been caught stealing twice. A chance for him on this night in the leadoff spot. Your Elk and Elk storylines brought to you by Elk and Elk, serious lawyers for serious injuries. Here's Ramon Castro, the catcher, batting in the fifth spot. 0 for 8 against Arroyo in his career. Ramon's been around. Solid backup catcher, and basically they're allowing him to catch Contreras. I mean, Pitsednik in the lineup in the leadoff spot. AJ Brzezinski is the everyday catcher, but they're trying to give Brzezinski a day off here or there, and they're giving Castro the chance to catch the big right hander. Well, they just got Castro not too long ago. Of course, they had former Red Corky Miller as their backup catcher all year long, and they just recently made a change there, let Corky go and ended up getting Castro. Well, I guess if you're Contreras and you're from Cuba, not bad to have Castro catch you, huh? Yeah. Give you extra motivation, huh? Try to throw the ball through him. Figuratively. Figuratively. 
Castro now 32 years of age. Spent time around the major leagues. Florida most recently the Mets the last three years swing and a miss and Arroyo has his third strikeout. Well, he's got that hook working. I'll tell you what this is a good night to throw it to hot and humid at the ballpark. No better time than midsummer in Cincinnati or St. Louis or Kansas City when the air is nice and thick and maybe muggy and not real comfortable to watch a ball game outside. But if you're a pitcher you love this kind of weather because it really grabs your breaking ball it grabs those seams and you can snap them off. Here's Chris Getz, the young second baseman. Getz, 25 years of age, fourth round draft pick four years ago out of the Big Ten. Went to Wake Forest and transferred to Michigan. Outstanding player at Michigan. Phillips knocks it down, pops up, got him. That's a gold glove play. One second baseman robbing another second baseman. But he went a long way to get that ball laid out for it perfectly. Glovia comes to his knees and gets the kid easily. I'll tell you what, that is some serious defense right there. When you're a Bronson Arroyo, you see your second baseman laying out like that. Boy, it just pumps you up. And that guy will do it for you. Chris, there's so many components to that catch. First, you have to have range. Then you have to have the hand-eye coordination to glove it. Then you have to have the core body strength to pop up. Using your stomach and your, your legs to be in position to throw, then you got to have a strong arm to throw it from your knees. I think the one thing you're missing there, George, you have to have the desire to want to make that point. Yep. And there are some infielders uh, that would, if they would, they'd reach down and try to get it, but they may not dive for it, at least not at this point in the ballgame. Ryan Anderson, a fly ball to center. There's Dickerson. He's got it. That's an easy inning. One, two, three. Another look at the Rawlings Gold Glove winner giving you a Gold Glove dose of defense. Baseball on Fox Sports Ohio being brought to you by Toyota in the third annual Civil Rights Game Weekend. For a dealer near you, visit buyatoyota.com. By JTM, food, family, and fun. That's JTM. And by Jeep, you talk, we listen. It's a new day. Have fun out there in your beep beep Jeep. It's Ramon Hernandez to lead it off bottom of two. He's in at 245. Homer's 26 knocked in. Jay Bruce, Ryan Hannigan to follow. Ramon back at first. It figures he'll catch some this weekend. Dusty Baker trying to get him behind the plate again. Trying to get him untracked offensively. There's a dribbler. And this will be another one that will end up being a base hit. Beckham could only put it in his pocket. And Chris, after all the balls he's hit right on the button and got nothing for, he was due for one of those. Well, you're right, George. He may be the last guy in his ball club you think would get an infield hit like that. Hustling down the line the entire way. 
You freeze the infielder with a full swing, you lay it down nice and soft down the line. Hey, don't forget when you come to the ballpark, take a peek up in left center field. See this beautiful new Toyota Tundra for Reds player hits the Tundra sign during tonight's game. Dean Lore of Union, Kentucky will win it. Register for your chance to win during an upcoming game at your Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky Toyota dealers. Here's Jay Bruce in at 214 leads the club with 16 homers 33 knocked in. He's had some flashes of brilliance in the last three weeks but the average continues to sink. Atlanta series had a. A homer and a couple of hits. Bouncer down to second. Gets will get one on the first in time. So Bruce bangs into a four-six-three twin killing and gets who got robbed of a hit does a nice job on this one. Well, when you get a sinker ball pitcher and a good fork ball pitcher like Jose Contreras up there, a ground ball double play is always a possibility. In fact, that's what he's going for most of the time. That would look like one of those fork balls that he throws outside. And if you pull off of it at all, what happened to Jay Bruce will happen to you. An easy four, six, three twin killing. So each pitcher helped by the defense first couple of innings. Here's Ryan Hannigan. Hannigan originally penciled in into the eighth spot in the lineup, but when Gonzalez was scratched just before the game started, he moved up to seven and Paul Janish, who was in short, inserted at short, moved to eight. Hannigan continues to lead all National League rookies in hitting. He's at 315. And every night you look up, Chris, he's got one or two hits, one for three, one for four. Or he's been on base at least once. That's why his on base percentage is higher than anybody else on this ball club. He'll take a walk. And he'll play situational baseball. There's a bouncer to the right side. Infield hit for the Reds. Nothing to show for it. We're going to the top of the third. Beckham will lead it off. All the events of the weekend, visit MLB.com slash civil rights game. Hope you have a chance to come down and join us tomorrow. It will be a very festive day and a whole festive weekend. It is a weekend dedicated to the game of baseball, but also dedicated to our country and the civil rights movement in town. Tomorrow will be former President Clinton to give the address at the luncheon at the Duke Energy Center. Bill Cosby, Muhammad Ali, Henry Aaron will be honored during the Civil Rights Weekend and at that luncheon. And they'll also be honored here at the ballpark tomorrow.
Fly ball left center field. Here comes Nix. He's got it. Beckham's retired for the first out of the third. And I think Chris, it's it's even more apropos when you remember the fact that it was Henry Aaron who really took Dusty Baker under his arm and was his center of gravity, was a father figure to him when he came up in the Atlanta organization. And Dusty will be the first to tell you how much he meant to him. Those hours and nights of talking baseball and talking about life. We'll hear from Dusty tomorrow talking about what Henry Aaron and what this weekend means to him. Here's Contreras. He will not get cheated. He'll take his swings, but in his career, he's 0 for 24 with 14 strikeouts. It's a bale and whale approach, huh? He hasn't whaled yet. The Royals see pumping fastballs in there, hoping that Contreras will throw him fastballs. As soon as he drops a hook on him, though, it'll be open game. Contact. Contreras, you talk about Ramirez defecting. Contreras spent the bulk of his young career in Cuba as a member of the national team. All those exhibition games they played, he was just so dominant. Look out, there's your breaking ball, and now it's open season. And right? Open season, <laughs> Contreras is going to drop some court balls Here on the row, and Hey, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. <laughs> so that's what that feels like. Put that in your memory bank, right? Two away. Here's Pitsetnik who walked in the first. Scoots up again, shows butt. Harrison charges. He takes it for a strike. I mean, Pitsetnik will go on a tear and just be electric at the top of a lineup, and then he almost disappears. The White Sox right now are catching lightning in a bottle, hoping that it will continue. Came up in the Texas organization. When Doug Melvin left Texas, took over in Milwaukee, he picked him up during the winter off waivers. And it was a great acquisition for Milwaukee. He had a great first year. One ball, two strikes. Starts. We've seen him do that more often than ever before. Dropping down and throwing a fastball to a lefty. Oh, what happens so often, George, is the fact that every time he drops down, he used to throw a curveball. So the word gets around the league that when Arroyo drops his arm angle real low, expect something slow. And eventually you got to pick that up and begin to work a fastball in there so that you're not easy to be guessed with. Liner, that's a base hit for Pitsednik. It's going to go all the way to the wall. Cut off by Dickerson, and they'll hold him to two. Good job by Dickerson. If that gets by him, Pitsednik's thinking three. So Pitsednik's been on base twice, a walk, and a double here with two outs in the third. Now, tried to sneak a fastball right by him, and he went out there and went with a good bit of hitting right there on a pitch, a two-seam sinking fastball, but when it's up around the waist, it doesn't sink much, so it just go from side to side, and he laces it in the gap. Great job by Dickerson. You could see Pitsednik heading into second. He was thinking three. And if it gets by Dickerson, he's got three in it, depending on where the bounce goes. Could have been even worse. So a runner at second, two away, and here's Ramirez. Great speed at the plate. Struck out on a breaking ball away, first time up. Remind you a little bit of Alfonso Soriano and Soriano came up early in his career. Soriano, of course, is filled out a little more and moved from his original position as shortstop now to the outfield. Ramirez, you figure, is going to fill in a little by little, too. But uncommonly strong hands for a guy who's this frail. When you stand next to him, he's 6'2, 6'3, but must weigh about 160 pounds. But firm handshake. Good strong hands. And he can motor. 
And he puts a barrel of the bat on the ball. Two and all. He became a fan darling last year in his first year, not only for some brilliant defensive plays at second, but also for the offense that he provided. Finished second in the American League Rookie of the Year balloting. Two and one. Oh. Well, you got Ryan Hannigan really sitting outside, quite a bit outside, and evidently that pitch broke before it got to the plate. Three one. Looped into right. Here comes Bruce. Got it. Good job, Jay Bruce. The runner stranded in the third. At the bottom of three we go. Yanish, Arroyo, Dickerson. Performance. Let's go back to June the 19th at 1938. Johnny Vandermeer's hitless innings pitch streak ends at 21 and two thirds after his back to back no hitters. Gave up a fourth inning single to Debs Garms of the Boston Bees. That's June the 19th, 1938. And every time anybody throws a no hitter, Chris, the next question is can they, might they, best Johnny Vandermeer's back to back no hitter story? And no one's come close. Amazing. Our Cabot Woodstain legendary performance. Here's Paul Yanish hitting in the eighth spot. Back to back, no hitters for Johnny Vandermeer. That's a pop up to the right side, heading towards the seats. It'll be out of play. Can you imagine that, Chris? I mean, just one is something, but how about two back to back and then finally giving up a hit 21 innings later? Amazing. And the other thing that was amazing, remember, the lights weren't that good back then either. You know, and they, did, <laughs> and they didn't change a ball out every time it got a little piece of dirt on it either. Yep. And he alluded they said, to throw that. the dark one in there, they meant it. <laughs> two balls, one strike. Contreras throws a heavy ball, he threw a dark ball. <laughs> I know a couple of Reds fans are sitting watching tonight that were great Johnny Vandermeer fans. Norm and Betty Gibbs celebrating their 61st anniversary tonight. Our congratulations to them, great Reds fans. Congratulations on number 61, Norm and Betty Gibbs. 
Well, George, back in 1906, how about uh, 2006 when the White Sox came into town during the last interleague play that they were here in Cincinnati? They brought in a team similar. They still have the same outfield. All these guys are the same. But Joe Creedy's gone. Uribe's gone. Tadahachi is gone. They still have Konerko, obviously. Chris Widger was a backup catcher at that time. Uh, Pacendic was on the ball club, but he didn't start the first game. That was a game started right here about the same time in June in 2006. Of course, Ozzie Guillen was the manager, and uh, that was the night that Brandon Clausen was a red starting pitcher that night. Took the loss in a 12 to 4 drubbing. There's a pitching coach, Don Cooper, next to him. Who might be the <laughs> most underrated pitching coach in all of baseball. Outstanding guy, too. Over 20 years in the White Sox organization, seven years with Ozzies. And this whole staff has been together. I mean, Harold Baines, the former great designated hitter, is the bench coach. Joey Cora has been there for six years. Greg Walker, the hitting coach, has been there six years. Two balls, two strikes to Bronson. Bouncer over the mound. Here comes Ramirez in the dirt, but picked by Canerco. Nice shot by Ramirez. You got a full view of his speed with that one. Very slow hopper. I mean, when hopped right over the head of Contreras, and you know, Bronson Arroyo runs pretty well. I mean, he's one of the fleeter footed pitchers on this ball club, and he's out by two full strides. That's a nice play by Ramirez. Man, oh man, that's athletic talent. The two away, and here comes Dickerson, who reached on a bunt hit, and then when Beckham threw it away, went to second to lead off the game in the bottom of the first for the Reds. Second gets gobbles it. The Reds go quietly in the third. To the fourth we go. Jermaine Dye will lead it off. for the Reds and the White Sox the most recent shortstop gold glove winners for the Reds and the White Sox answer coming up this is the last shortstop to win a gold glove for the Reds is Barry huh I would think so yeah great tradition of great red shortstops Davey Concepcion who wore number 13 and that's the number that Ozzie Guillen wore throughout his career as a amateur and, and still in the wintertime Ozzie seeks out he still lives in Venezuela during the winter and he of course was with Louis Aparicio on the in winter baseball as a guest coach 
It's a ground ball out. Dye is retired. Great tradition. Aparicio, a brilliant shortstop. Ozzy, a great shortstop among the White Sox. Even Don Kessinger. My favorite Ozzy Gian story, one of my favorite Ozzy Gian stories, was the day that Tom Seaver won his 300th game. It was at Yankee Stadium, and before the game, I mean, Seaver was always, you know, stone faced. I mean, he, he never really. He didn't bother him the day of the game he pitched, no doubt. But it was the same day that Phil Rizzuto was honored. <laughs> he gave him a cow. <laughs> they retired his number and everything. And Seaver comes in, and before the game, Ozzy comes up to Seaver. He says, "You're going to win your 300th today, and I'm going to get the, the the winning hit, and I'm going to catch the final out." Son of a gun, he did both of those things. No he did. <laughs> he still has one on Tom Terrific to this day because of that. And Erko bounces out two away. I played winter ball with Ozzie Gein when he was about 17 years old and down in LaGuaira, Venezuela. And he took shortstop seriously back then. He didn't get to play a lot because we had a, a veteran ball club down there. But he was the mildest, most soft spoken young man you'd ever see in your life. And then, of course, now he's been fined numerous times <laughs> for, you know, getting on umpires and saying expletives in public and on tape. And he's not afraid to say anything to anybody at any time. I said, Ozzy, what happened to you? You were such a nice young man. Where did you go wrong here? He said, These guys make me crazy. <laughs> Here's Castro struck out first time up. And don't forget, order one of La Rosa's game time deals. Call 347 1111 or order online at LaRosas.com. Real flavor, real family recipes, real value from La Rosa's. Mike LaRosa came with us to Kansas City. He was in charge of the offense. We'll, put, we'll leave him in charge of the pizzas. Next time he's got to get some more runs. Great family tradition. The La Rosa family in sports here in Cincinnati. Two balls, one strike. Second walk allowed by Arroyo. He walked but Setnik to lead off the game. And that brings up Getz who bounced out. Robbed of a hit on a great play by Brandon Phillips in the second inning. The amazing thing about Ozzie Gian, and you talk about him, he was so mild mannered when he first came up. I remember he pronounced his game Gijen. You yeah. remember that? Yeah. And he came up and I went up to him and asked him, I said, How do you want your name? Pronounced because in Venezuela it was Guillen and everybody was calling him Ozzy Guillen. He says, I don't care if they want to call me Guillen, that's fine. And then he smiled, never never said boo, didn't didn't mind a bit. Someone else might uh, take exception to it. But he was a guy who he got decked in a double play at second base, tore up his knee, and they thought his career was over. He came back, worked as hard as anybody you've ever seen. And still gave you gold glove caliber shortstop play after that. One ball, one strike. Uh oh, that's hit deep to the right, going back, looking up. It will be gone. Uh, two out walk, and Chris Getz will get his first home run. One pitch drilled to right. And it's 2 0 Chicago. Well, he's a young man, George. You mentioned it earlier that he has not been in the big leagues all that long. That looks like it was just a little breaking ball that Arroyo got kind of on the side of. And it hung up there, didn't have a lot of depth on it, and guess the left hander came right into his wheelhouse. Boy, of all the people in this lineup that you think that would, would hurt you. You know, you get down towards the bottom of this lineup, and there's not a lot of power to go around. First career home run for Getz, first of this year, obviously. Came up at the tail end of last year. And it's
It's 2 0 the White Sox with the lead. Here's Brian Anderson, the center fielder, who flied out to Dickerson first time up. Up right side, Hernandez foul territory. He's got it, but the damage done. Oh, those walks will haunt. A two out walk to Castro. Homer by Getz. Two nothing. White Sox. Of the day the question who were the most recent shortstop gold glove winners for the Reds and the White Sox see how close we got Chris. the answers Barry Larkin and Ozzy Larkin in 94 95 and 96 and Ozzy in 1990 and there's another Cincinnati product there's Daryl Boston right there DB along with Ozzy Guillen and Harold Baines now Baines could hit a little bit, huh? No, you're not kidding about that. He had that high leg step, you know, that kind of almost a Sada Hera O type of uh, approach to hitting. But when he put that front foot down, look out. When you lump him in a group that includes Hal McRae as the greatest designated hitters of all time due to injuries, and he'll never get, he's he's been on the Hall of Fame ballot and got a smattering of votes, but he'll probably never get in. But he was as dominant an offensive player when you faced him he was the guy that you didn't want to let beat you exactly speak softly carry a big stick he never said boo to anybody <laughs> here's Jerry Harrison Jr. he sacrificed in the first that moved Dickerson from second to third with one out but Phillips grounded out Nick's flight out Ritz couldn't get the run in Jerry up for the second time. Now one of the storylines that we've been following the last couple of weeks, we went to Kansas City, visited the Negro Leagues Hall of Fame. We showed you the footage of Jerry visiting the display that honors his dad and his grandfather, Sam, who was a member of the White Sox and a longtime coach, is the bloodlines of the Harrison family and the Negro Leagues. There's a look back at the footage it was a proud moment for him I mean he was busting his butt wasn't he special and his dad of course played for the White Sox one of the best pinch hitters I think he still has the all time pinch hit record here in Chicago with the White Sox 
you put him up in a tough situation, he find a way to get the bat on the mm -hmm. ball. Led the American League in pinch hits on a couple of occasions. Two balls, two strikes. Sawed off right at the knuckles does Jerry Harrison and the pitcher Jose Contreras never does touch this ball but Alexa Ramirez comes running in there very quickly and for the second time in a couple of innings he makes a real nice barehanded play and he fires his man out of first. Great speed great quickness outstanding arm. He's got all the components of a great infielder. Well Kenny Williams saw him at one of those international uh, Baseball contest, George, a tournament, and uh, Kenny, Kenny Williams, of course, is the general manager for the White Sox, and said immediately, "I've got to have that guy." And then when Ramirez was able to defect from the Cuban team and take up residency in the Dominican Republic, he actually joined his wife and family there, who had already been living there. Then he was able to negotiate with whatever team he wanted, and it was the White Sox that came after him the hardest and immediately gave him a, a big league four-year deal. Kenny Williams is not shy about trying to find a way to keep his club in it and you have a feeling if they stay where they are that as we approach the trading deadline they'll come up with a, a deal to keep them close. Of course last year he worked to deal with the Reds for Ken Griffey Jr. and the Reds got Nick Massett. In fact all the White Sox were asking about Nick before the game. He was a very popular guy on that ball club. You're right and you know in the meantime though George and they're still in the race obviously everybody in that American League division is in the race in the central. The Indians are the furthest behind. They're seven games back, at least going into today's game, in which they did finally unbelievably blow a huge lead to the Cubs and lost eight to seven in ten innings. But in the meantime, they're taking a look at some of their young players, like Gordon Beckham at third base, who's really a shortstop, and also Chris Getz, who hit the home run off of Bronson Arroyo at second. Getz, by the way, was taken last year in the draft, number eight in the draft in the first round. That is one pick after Yonder Alonso. In fact, there were, there were quite a few Chicago White Sox people in their front office that were more than delighted to find out that the Reds did not pick Gordon Beckham when he was available number seven. The Reds went after the left-handed hitting first baseman, and the White Sox ended up grabbing Beckham, and here he is in the big leagues. Beckham, a shortstop in college on this club. Playing and they've moved him around at second and at third in the minor leagues. He's playing here at third. Phillips bounces out two away, and here comes Lance Nix. Farmers Insurance. Oh, I'm sorry, George. You go ahead. Was, promos first. I'm just going to say that Farmers Insurance, a proud sponsor of the Civil Rights Game on Fox Sports Ohio. Reds fans be sure to stop by the farmers booth at the fan zone at the ballpark all weekend learn to look more about career opportunities with farmers insurance. Do you have farmers insurance. I will after that. Will after that. <laughs> There's a shot into the right field corner. Nix will round first go to second. He's in second with a two out double. Let's see if the Reds can take advantage of a two out base runner like the White Sox did in the fourth. A little by little it seems like. Lance Nix is getting a little better at the off speed pitch. He still likes the ball up in the zone, and most left handers like it down, but he likes it about waist high and up from there. And he waited very nicely on that, on that fork ball that Contreras tossed up there, and he rips it right down the line. But the interruption I was going to ask you to, to look at, George, as we take a look at the point of contact, and boy, he keeps his eye right on it there. Is that if Gordon Beckham is good enough to make it right out of Georgia to come up to the major leagues the year after? And he was picked eighth in the first round. And Yonder Alonso out of the University of Miami was picked seventh in the first round. Is there? I mean, is he ready not or not? I mean, are they are the White Sox rushing this kid up there, or is it just two different philosophies on how to bring their youngsters along out of the minor leagues? I think it's two different philosophies. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, the Reds, and if you talk to Walt Jockety, he feels that Yonder Alonso is going to be a major league hitter. The question is. 
do you bring him up? And obviously the time to bring him up would have been when Joey Votto went down. But mm -hmm. you didn't know how long Joey would be down for. And the Reds, I mean the Reds problem has not been, you're not bringing up a plus defender. You're bringing up a guy who can hit. And the one thing you have in Beckham is a guy who can play defense. I mean he's a better, probably a better shortstop than a third baseman. He said that he's not that comfortable at third. But I think you talk about a difference in philosophy of the use of the minor leagues. I think what Walt Jockerty's trying to do is in an orderly fashion build this farm system back up. I think Kenny Williams and Ozzie Gian right now are hoping to find a way to stay in the race and find a way to win. Mm -hmm. I mean look at the, the, the White Sox were close to making a deal for Peavy and it fell through at the 11th hour. There's a shot down the right field line. It's a foul ball. I mean. That was before they got Contreras back. They didn't know that Contreras would be as good as he's been coming back. So it's it's a different philosophy. Yeah. Um, do you think Alonzo's ready to be up here? I don't know. I haven't seen him play. I, I mean, I didn't think that based on what I saw in spring training that he would come up here and have a big measure of success. But you know, sometimes you take a shot at a kid, and the the at bats that you give him in the major leagues, even if he's not ready, are going to give him a taste of what it's like. I do know that it's easier to hit as you go up the minor league ladder than it is way down at low A ball somewhere because down at A ball those kids have good stuff but they have no idea where they're throwing it. It's a very difficult league to hit it. That's a fair ball. This will get it done. Rounding third scoring easily will be next going into second will be Ramon Hernandez and Ramon's found a way out of his slump. An infield hit in the second a double here in the fourth and just like. The White Sox used two out lightning in the top of the fourth. The Reds have done the same here. Well, if you think it's luck that Ramon Hernandez hits this ball down the right field line, you didn't pay attention on the previous pitch when he hit it down the right field line just foul. I mean, he is going that way and going that way hard. And that is some kind of slick hitting there. So Contreras after pitching two straight eight inning shutouts and three plus innings here in the fourth finally gives up a run after coming back from the minor leagues. So 16 plus three 19 and two thirds innings and he finally gave up a run and the Reds would like to push another across here with Bruce at the plate. I think if you talk to Scott's back to Beckham and Alonzo. I think most scouts would agree that Alonzo was a better offensive player, yep. but Beckham was a better baseball player at that stage of their career when they were drafted, and probably true to this year too, athletically from a defensive standpoint. That said, I would not have minded seeing Alonzo oh, sure. for a short period. Yep. Give the kid a little bit of experience. I mean, you're going to use an option up at the end of the year anyway. Mm -hmm. Hernandez off second. Here's the 2 1. That's in there for a strike. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I will have no misconceptions that Yonder Alonzo will come up here and step in right where Joey Votto left off. Okay, we understand that's not going to happen. Maybe it's more of a, a curiosity thing than anything else, huh? By the way, Joey went down to Sarasota to start his road back to the major leagues, get his bat back and his game back in shape. Tries to check it. He does. And from all indications, we probably won't see him at the major league level until after next week's road trip is completed, meaning this weekend and then on to Toronto and on to Cleveland and then when the Reds return home. That's just a guess. Yeah, you know what? And I think that he's the guy, George, is going to make that call. Today he played it. He had six innings at first base uh, during the ball game today, and then he had a, a simulated game in which he had six at bats, had three stolen bases, a couple of walks, a single, and a double. Way out in front of a 77 mile an hour delivery. Bruce strikes out, but doubles by Nixon Hernandez. The Reds are on the board. They trail two to one.
That was the one swing frozen in time. AT&T, the nation's fastest 3G network. AT&T, your world delivered. So Royal back to work. Here's Gordon Beckham hitting in the eighth spot. Fly to left first time up. Down to third. Harrison has it. And Beckham's retired for the second time. And here comes Contreras. And hey, there's no better place to spend Father's Day than at the Reds game on Sunday. It's Dad Appreciation Day at Great American Ballpark. And the first 10,000 dads in attendance will receive a tie and a special keepsake box presented by Cons. For tickets, call 513-381-REDS or go to reds.com. You guys look pretty sharp in those ties the other night. Except they got a little wet by the end of the night. Yeah, they were <laughs> soggy, George, but they've dried out. And, you know, they hold their color pretty well despite being dunked and saturated. Is Contreras who struck out back in the third. That's really a pretty nice Father's Day gift. Yep. What we got to do is get our high home cameraman Jim Strickler to wear that tie with the shirt that he has tonight. Oh yeah. He's got his Don Ho look-alike uniform on. He's got the parrot head look working, doesn't he? <laughs> doesn't he look marvelous? You got something to sing for a streak tonight? No. <laughs> Strikeout for Bronson. He gets Contreras for the second time. Fifth strikeout overall. Two away and back to the top of the order, Pitsednik. Scott's been on twice, a walk and a double. Rack him up. Five on the night. Hey, you get the feeling that Bronson Arroyo realizes right now. He looks up at the scoreboard. The White Sox have two hits. The Reds have four. It's two to one. And just the, the way the energy of this ball game go, is going, and of course the energy of the of the offenses of both of these teams. I mean, both of these teams have really struggled against right-handers. The White Sox are a very poor hitting ball club, a 248 hitting team. The Reds are a 239 hitting team against right-handers, and you know. You, you pitch to the tempo of the game or the score of the game if you're a pitcher. I think Arroyo stand out there right now thinking, you know what? I cannot afford to give up anything more to this White Sox ball club. I got to throw zeros up from here on out. That's a psyche that you know can get into, and in some cases has gotten into this Reds pitching staff with the lack of offense that the Reds have. I can psych you out. There's no question about that. There's many times a pitcher will stand on the mound and say, man, I've got to pitch against you know. This great hitting team, and that other guy gets a pitch against us. Phillips got Brandon Phillips ranging far to his left. It's a one, two, three for Branson. The Royal do up third when we return.
Brewers replica mesh jersey, just like the one the players will wear for the game, courtesy of Duke Energy for Reds tickets. Call 513-381-REDS or go to Reds.com. Now you've got a choice. Do you like door number one with Chris Welch in the Civil Rights game Frank Robinson jersey, or do you like Jim Strickler in his Don Ho lookalike shirt? You'll take that one. I like this one too, George. You know what? They are pretty neat. In fact, I'm, gonna, I'm keeping this one. <laughs> That's the fourth one you got this week. Oh, <laughs> I went through the turnstile four times. <laughs> That's the old bobblehead day trick. You know? That's it. You buy four tickets, you go in, you go back out. You go back in, you get back out. I learned from you. I learned from Jesse. <laughs> Here's Ryan Hannigan to lead off the bottom of the fifth. By the way, Jess, I have to apologize to you. I heard I heard uh, the guys the other day talking about how we make fun of your trunk. And I don't want to mislead everybody. It's no longer a trunk. Years ago, he's got a van and with, with the hangers and everything. So it's not just a trunk. It's a big-time operation. Hannigan down the right field line into the corner. He'll round first, go to second, and the Reds have a leadoff double. Mighty try for three. Yes, he is. Here comes the relay. They won't even make it. Ryan Hannigan thought I'm at second pretty good, and he turned around and got waved on, and he winds up to three. The first triple of his career. He's done about everything you can do that's good this year. Here's something new. You know, Ryan Hannigan's a smart guy. He saw the other catcher now playing first base, Ramon Hernandez, go down that right field line and get an extra base hit in the second inning, or, or in the last inning to drive in Lance Nix. He says, you know what, Ramon, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm booking on into third base because Mark Berry there was waving him on. Hannigan did the right thing as he rounded the bag. Instead of looking over his shoulder at the ball, he picked up the third base coach. And Dye missed the cutoff, man, and that was a helpful thing for Hannigan to get the third. So now with the bottom of the order, we may be looking at a squeeze butt coming up here sometime. First triple of his career. There's a bouncer down to third on the first pitch, and the Reds runner will hold the third. First out of the inning. Well, Paul Yanish, the late replacement in the lineup for Alex Gonzalez, first pitch swinging, bounces one to the one place. He had no chance of getting the runner in. That's down to third, so one away. And here comes Arroyo. Now, don't rule out the possibility. He's one of the Reds' best bunners. He leads the Reds in sacrifice hits. So if you're the White Sox and Ozzie Guillen, which pitches here do you throw a pitch out? The first one. Shows no inclination to bunt there. Steps out, takes a look at Mark Barrier rolls through signs. In the first, the Reds got a runner to second with nobody out. Harrison sacrificed Dickerson to third, but then a ground out and a fly out. Swing and a miss, and it's one and one. Sure, Hannigan knows what's going on. One ball, one strike. Let's see what the White Sox do. It's a bouncer off the glove of the pitcher. The throw will be in time. Good job by Contreras, and the Reds still don't get the run in. Well, he hit it sharply. He hit it at the right guy, too. Usually, this ball will get right through the pitcher's box and for a base hit. Contreras kind of a funky little backhand approach to knock it down and then he recovers quickly to make a nice play out of it. All the while Ryan Hannigan has the best seat in the house standing there at third base. He can't go anywhere. So now the White Sox after having to bring the infield in for the last two batters they can drop the infield back and here comes Hannigan at third and Dickerson the leadoff hitter at the plate that don't rule out another bunt though not a squeeze bunt but with two outs with the infield pull back on the right side Dickerson a pretty good bunter he drops down a decent bunt he can beat it out for a hit and get the run in unlikely but still a possibility and he'll work from the stretch does Contreras.
Ian and Don Cooper's pitching coach looking on from the White Sox bench. Slow, slower, slowest. Now there was a time that Jose Contreras would throw so many wild pitches in a, a year that you'd have a pretty good chance with a man on third base getting him in. He has had as many as 20 wild pitches in a year, but he's really curtailed that the last couple of seasons. Last year only had six. The year before that only three. He's thrown two this year. It pretty good to right, but right it died. Jermaine has it. A leadoff triple by the Reds. And they go 0 for 3 with a runner sitting at third. Three seven six six four. They'll be entered to win a prize package featuring a barbecue grill, patio furniture, a flat screen HD TV from Fox Sports Ohio, and the chance to mow the lawn at Chris Welch's Ponderosa in Northern Kentucky. For official rules and an alternate form of entry, go to FoxSports.com/backslash/Ohio. You bet it's cool. Hey, we have multiple winners for that, George. <laughs> Even more for weed whacking yeah. like that. <laughs> it's Jesse's turn to whack the weeds. I do the lawn this week. Here's Ramirez struck out and lined out 0 for 2. The two runs that the White Sox have came in the fourth. The two out walk to Castro and the first career homer for Chris Getz. 2 nothing White Sox. Red's got a run back. It's a 2 to 1 ball game. Cincinnati scoring its run on back to back doubles by Nixon Hernandez in the fourth. Two strikes. Popped up, gonna be room. Hannigan back, he'll run out of space. Chris, on a day when the temperature's in the upper 80s, humidity just about matching that, his teammates gave him a little extra time to take a blow on the bench before he came back out after. Running out that triple, you get sapped on a night like this. Well, you know, George, it's not only this it like running around the base that saps you, but it's the everyday fatigue that eventually sets in. And here we are in June, we're already getting July and August weather. I'd imagine that you're going to see him get a blow here probably tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And Ramon Hernandez is behind the plate just to kind of switch him up a little bit. 
Dusty saying he wants Hernandez to catch a couple of times this week. Two balls, two strikes. And I tell you, Ramon hasn't said boo, but you know it's like once you're a shortstop, you're always a shortstop. Once you're a catcher, you're always a catcher. He's playing first and doing the best he can down there, but. And that's been the thing I think that's been most impressive about his presence on this ball club. Whatever you've asked him to do this year, he's done it and gladly so. 3 2. And the dirt and the speed burner Ramirez is on. He's stolen 10, been caught only twice. Don't forget the best sports show, period. The greatest nightly sports show on TV. Host Chris Rhodes, Carissa Thompson coming your way. Weeknights only on Fox Sports Ohio, presented by 1 800 Safe Auto. The best sports show, period. Struck out, bounced out, 0 for 2. Breaking ball drops in there for a strike. of the year for Ramirez. Now they had a good pitch to throw him out on that's for certain it was either a pitch out or a modified pitch out right there a high fastball had that throw been down on the money absolutely they would have had Ramirez no problem. And usually Ryan Hannigan is right on the money with that throw that time it just took the second base a little bit high and Ramirez is in there. The runner in scoring position with no one out here in the six, and that's a call strike three. Well, that's what you need. You need a something a little extra, a pop up or a strikeout with the runner on second, and that's what a Royal gets. I got to figure that Jermaine Dye is looking fat or looking for a breaking ball on that count. In the first inning, Bronson Royal struck him out on a one-two count with a curveball. That time, that fastball looked like it was going to stay outside. It came back and touched the outside corner, and Dye's got a couple of punch outs. Surround on the outside of a ground ball to shortstop. So the runner's still sitting at second. And you know he's got great speed with Paul Canerco at the plate. Canerco bounced to second, bounced to third, 0 for 2. Strikes to the run producer Canerco sitting on 998 runs batted in for his career.
Castro follows Canerco and then gets who's already homered. First base open. Coming into tonight, Canerco was two for seven and a homer against the Royal, the only member of this starting lineup for the White Sox who had had a homer off Bronson. Full count three two. Is next. He's there. Got it. The runner goes halfway and retreats to second. Canerco got on top of it, didn't get enough to turn on it. And it's a line drive out for the second out of the inning. Well, had the White Sox and Jermaine Dye been able to get that run over to third base, that would have been another run for the White Sox. Boy, the importance of doing those little things that the Reds have had runners at third base twice in this ball game, less than two outs, unable to convert. White Sox right there maybe have squandered a chance to add on. There's Castro a two out walk in the fourth set the stage for the gets homer. And that's the two runs that the White Sox have right now that's in there for a strike says Chad Fairchild the home plate umpire. Jermaine usually gets the job done that time. He didn't take in a call strike three. Fouled <laughs> off and it's 0 and 2. Yeah, they just picked up Castro from the New York Mets at the very end of the month of May. For a right handed pitcher named Lance Broadway, who's a cinch to make it big in, in the, the Big order. Apple. <laughs> Can't make it there, he could make it anywhere. No balls, two strikes. That's up high. This is a different White Sox team than you're used to seeing. It, you know, it's a team that for this decade has more home runs as a team than anybody else in baseball. They usually lead the American League or their second or third. In fact, going into tonight, they had 68 home runs, the Reds 65. So usually at this time of year, they'd have probably around 100 home runs. Yeah, you're right, George. But this is a ball club that very much parallels the Reds' offensive mm -hmm. woes, especially in the month of June. In the month of June, this White Sox team, despite having guys like Jermaine Dye and Jim Tomei on, it's still a collective batting average of 230. Line drive, can he get there? Nix does. Battling the lights, Lance Nix hauls it in. So good job by Bronson. A walk and a stolen base, but he strands a runner at second.
and that's been used to advantage by Bronson Arroyo on this night. Well, it's a good night to throw it because it's nice and humid. The ball breaks a lot more on a humid night, and boy, he is snapping it off big time this evening. Our Coors Light freeze cam brought to you by Frost Brewed Coors Light here at Great American Ballpark. We celebrate this Civil Rights Weekend by welcoming an old friend and a, a great icon in sports in the United States, Sugar Ray Leonard. Sugar Ray, great to have you with us. Good to see you again, buddy. Thank you. Thank you How so are you? Good to see you, man. How you doing, man? <laughs> what a weekend, huh? Oh, what a special is, time. This is so awesome, man. I'm so happy to be a part of it. You know, this is the first annual. Yep. And um, I was here. <laughs> Very historic. You were here a lot of historic places. And leading it off, there's a rocket shot by Jerry Harrison Jr. into left field for a base hit. The Reds get the leadoff hitter on. Sure, Ray, you've spent, I mean, you spent your life in the ring, obviously. You know, you, you won a, a gold medal. You're a great amateur boxer, a tremendous professional. But more than anything, you've devoted your life, not just to your kids, but to kids in general. And that's why you're here on this special weekend. There's no question about that. You know, to be of service. I mean, I'm a, I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I've got four grandkids. And uh, I've had a wonderful life, an illustrious career. And for me, it's all about giving back. And this weekend is something special. Uh, you know, you talk about you were a great fighter. How about Muhammad, oh, the great one? <laughs> for, for me to present an award to Muhammad Ali, my idol, I mean, a man that I tried to emulate so many times, this is heaven. You could, uh, you know, move like a butterfly, sting like a bee sometimes, too, in, the, in your weight class. But he reminds me, he said, Ray, no matter what, I'm still the prettiest. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's a pretty man outside. He's a pretty man inside, too, isn't he? He's a powerful man. I mean, for what he stood up for, you know, what his beliefs were, uh, proved to me that he was more than a fighter inside the ring. He was a fighter outside the ring, too. There's Brandon Phillips. Phillips 0 for 2 tonight. He's got a runner on first. Contreras to the stretch. The Reds trailer by one. Sugar Ray, after the ball game and before the fireworks tonight, you're set to deliver an inspirational speech and message to the fans that are here. We got a big crowd here at Great American Ballpark tonight. Um, can you give us a little preview of what you're going to talk about? Well, I, I think basically because, it, because I, I do motivational speaking, you know, I use boxing or fighting as a metaphor, and we have to continue to be fighters because I mean this recession is times are tough for everyone, and I think if you keep your chin up, you know, stay positive and work hard, things do turn around. Of course, the game of baseball was blessed with the great Jackie Robinson. And here this weekend also, Bill Cosby, Henry Aaron, uh, who set the all-time home run record uh, when he was active. People who not only were outstanding on the field, but who believed in the fight, who believed in America, who believed in pulling together. And that's something that really has marked your life. Well, and it's, it's, it's a matter of not just making a mark in the sport, but it's making a mark in life, doing something that benefits other people. And I think that's a wonderful thing to do. Reds would love that. Brandon Phillips benefit them right now. One ball, one strike with Jerry Harrison Jr. leading off first. And pitch had nothing going. Now you look at the guy down at first, Jerry Harrison Jr. His dad played in the major leagues, Jerry Harrison Sr. His granddad, Sam, was a major leaguer too. Three generations in uh, a family that's dedicated itself to baseball played through and you know that from a boxing standpoint it's about passing the history passing the tradition on well, my son would never put down <laughs> <laughs> Bernie that will let him will no way saying, right no way you, you, you either have it or you don't <laughs> You started boxing at age 14. Did you ever play baseball? You know, I thought I swear I thought it was too dangerous. <laughs> I really thought it was too dangerous. That ball come by whizzing past my head. There goes the runner. It's hit deep to left. Going way back. It's going to be gone. Reds lead 3 I think he got the preview of your pep talk and uh, Brandon Phillips delivered. <laughs> well, that's the kind of pitch that a right-hand hitter like Brandon Phillips just dreams about. A breaking ball that he hangs right inside, and Brandon Phillips knows as soon as that ball comes off the bat, it's bye-bye. 
Brandon Phillips' 11th home run. You were a Gold Gloves winner, and he was a Gold Glove winner last year at second base, and he did it with the bat today. Brandon Phillips with a big time swing. <laughs> There's how, how, big is, son. how big is he? He's about uh, six one, yeah. about 195. Uh, you put him in the ring. You get him down to about 170, right? <laughs> uh, well, heavyweights today are like, you know, they're 240, 250. Either he go up or you bring him down. He goes down. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you got Hagler, you got Hearns, you got Benitez. Toughest fight for you. The toughest fight was uh, Tommy Hearns, without yeah. question, because Tommy Hearns was, I tell you, at 147, Walter Waite, he was a freak of nature. He was 6'1", yeah. 6'2", six, six, long. long arms, fast, had more, had more of a kamikaze mentality, but he was a great fighter. What an awesome guy. Of all the guys you fought against, who did you respect the most when it was all said and done? It was Tommy Hearns, without yeah. question. Tommy Hearns. The two of you became pretty good friends afterwards, too, huh? But he calls me periodically. Ray, I said, yeah, Tommy, how much do you weigh? I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> why, Tommy? That's a base hit by Lance Dix into center field, and the Reds have parlayed back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back hits. A single, a homer, and a base hit. Nobody out in the six. We continue to visit with boxing champ and great American, Sugar Ray Leonard. Now, Sugar Ray, you look like you're in great shape. You, I'm, I know you're not in the ring sparring anymore, but what do you do to, or maybe you are, uh, what do you do to stay in shape? I don't spar, no. Um, I hit the bags, and I do run. I run pretty, I run about maybe five times a week, four or five miles, and I just do maintenance because I hate weights, but I do them <laughs> because I need them because I just turn 50 from the <laughs> But, um, you no, know, I feel great. I think it's, it's about, your whole life is about attitude. Mm -hmm. It really is. And I maintain a good attitude. For those people that uh, won't be fortunate enough to be at the luncheon tomorrow, what kind of impression did uh, Muhammad Ali make in your life, and what kind of a message will you deliver? Well, Muhammad Ali was like almost a surrogate father to me. I, mean, he, I believed in him so much because even when he fought George Foreman, because I was so afraid that George was going to hurt him. But he, Ali taught me and showed me that psychological warfare is also important, too, in boxing. And uh, I can't wait to see him. That smile will never, will, will <laughs> never, you know, no matter what afflictions he has, the smile will always be there, won't it? No question about that. Civil rights game tomorrow, and Don Cooper, the pitching coach, out to talk to Contreras. We continue to visit with Sugar Ray Leonard. And when you talk about tomorrow, it's about... Henry Aaron, it's about Bill Cosby, the former president, Bill Clinton, will be here, too. It's a power-packed day tomorrow, isn't it? I mean, that threesome there is amazing. Hope, life, and change. That's what it's all about. And that's what you preached in a lot of your motivational speeches. I mean, and you were doing this when you were boxing, too. It didn't just come. You're not a John Lee come lately to this. I remember my days... Uh, uh, at ESPN during the 80s, you were like, uh, yeah, whenever we needed you, you were there to talk to kids. When it, whenever you were called upon, you were always there for kids. Well, especially in this, in this generation and the technology, and the kids face so much from peer pressure to just trying to trying to fit in. And um, I try to encourage them to be leaders and not followers. That's foul in the left field corner. Two balls and one strike for Sugar Ray. Baseball, it's kind of a nice ballpark, isn't it? You had a chance to. Beautiful. This is, you know, this is my first time here, and uh, my son. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say to him <laughs> if he sees this. What, what, what do you think I should say to him? <laughs> what can I say to Daniel? Say, learn how to play golf or tennis. It's easier, right? <laughs> <laughs> Chris will teach you. I, I don't know about that. I would say Brandon Phillips may give you some advice. Uh, he's having a pretty good time down here playing baseball. I'll check with him. Give us an update on the kids. Well, little Ray, little Ray 35, yep. and four, great, four kids. Uh, Jarrell is 24. Um, my daughter, Camille, is 12. And Daniel uh, is 8. He plays baseball, he plays football, swimming, track. He does it all. He's such an athlete. He's such a wonderful kid. So he got Bernadette's jeans. And Bernadette, my wife. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, she did. I just, I'm a little slow there. <laughs> I didn't quite catch that. 
Here's Ramon Hernandez who doubled last time up. He follows this one off. We continue to visit with Sugar Ray Leonard who's here. Part of our Civil Rights Weekend. He'll be giving an inspirational speech after the game today. Tomorrow he'll be at the Duke Energy Center to deliver the opening one of the opening speeches for the great Muhammad Ali and I know uh, there'll be a treat for everybody Chris you know George I want to ask you great when you speak to groups of young men you know, kids growing up do you recommend boxing as a way to go to, to improve their life to get their work habits going right and maybe in, infuse some discipline well what what's what's so great about boxing is the fact that it demands discipline it demands uh, you keep things in order it demands that you do work that you stay focused, that you stay on top of things. And just like life, you gotta stay on top of things. You gotta stay in shape. Your mind has to be the mental stability. You gotta be disciplined. I mean, all the things that are applicable in boxing are applicable also in life. When you know, you I've been dying to ask her, I, I, I mean, the boxer of Sugar Ray's <laughs> level, I mean, these kind of questions, George, I never get to talk to somebody like this. I mean, when you're ready to have a, a fight, when you're ready to, to, to square off with Hagler or somebody, I mean, did you want to hurt Why are you making, you, you why are you making a fist? <laughs> oh, I better not make a fist or anything, my friend. <laughs> friend. I was just kind of holding my pencil there. <laughs> We need him. Okay. We need him. Take it easy. Yeah, listen, that's a long way down. <laughs> uh, did, did you did you get yourself into a, 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 frenzy? Psych, a frenzy where you wanted to hurt him? Did you did you want to score points? Did you want to knock him out? What, what was the what was the feeling like just before the fight begins? Most fighters need to create an aggression to, to get out there and train hard and to go for the guy. I I did the opposite because yep. for me it was all about being calm and collective and and also creating a, a scenario in my head of. How I want this fight to, to turn out, and for the most part, it's like choreography. For the most part, it comes to fruition. But a lot of times, guys don't always participate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talk about the mental side of boxing, and very often, I mean, Angelo Dundee always said it that you win the game in your mind first before you Without win question. the question. And so often, the success or failure of a baseball player or a boxer comes not in the physical part, but in the mental preparation and the mental way you enact your game plan. It relates to everything, not every sport, business, life. You got to stay optimistic. I mean, look at Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. He's a prime example. I mean, he's like, whew. Have you golfed with Tiger? <laughs> no, I haven't had the chance. <laughs> There's a pop up in the right center. Jermaine Dye is there, and there's your second out. When you, and Chris, you asked the question, and really, I know in covering boxing, my earlier years, I did a lot of boxing. You were really the exception, not the rule. I mean, if you saw or talked to most athletes, most boxers, they were in a trance, and nobody got near them. But it's like instead of getting closed, you opened your eyes. Before you got into the ring, it's like you were open. You saw everything, and you riveted on everything that was there. You know, for some reason, boxing brought me out from under the rock because I was such an introverted kid, such a quiet kid, shy kid. Boxing gave me confidence, and I became uh, extroverted. I became outspoken in sense. <laughs> almost sometimes too much, my wife tells me. <laughs> that's funny because that's exactly the same message that Henry Aaron gave to so many young people. He'll be there tomorrow, too. And he said the key so much in life is confidence. Confidence in yourself first confidence. and then in confidence what your job will be. You have to be confident. Well, the, message that, confident. the message that you bring is sensational. And I know the folks here tonight before the fireworks are going to relish in it. I know I'm delighted to, and, and honored to be, just be, a, be in attendance tomorrow uh, at the luncheon. Very much looking forward to it. And it's great that uh, you're able to come up this evening. Show him how to defend himself here. When you get, I'll hold him up. When George comes after me, what should I do? Just no, the other no, way? do what you just did to me. You made a fist. If it's some apparent reason, you made two fists. Right. Back away. Back away. No mas. No, no mas. <laughs> Thanks, Sugar Ray. Thanks for Thank stopping you, by, man. Take care, buddy. Best. Continue good health and good luck. <laughs> Sugar Ray Leonard, great to have him with us. Wow. Uh, he's got a busy schedule tonight, but he was nice enough to stop by for a, a moment or two to talk boxing, talk baseball, and talk life. There's a looper in the right center. That's going to drop for a base hit. The Ryan Hannigan. Will bloop one in the right center. He's now two for three, a triple and a single. He's a special guy, Chris. Oh, there's no question yeah. about that, George. You know, I, 
power boxing only yeah. kind of on the periphery, just a little bit. But when you have a just a, a magnetic personality like Sugar Ray, uh, of course you watch him every time you possibly could. And it was an honor to meet him right there. Just a tremendous athlete, so fast with his hands. And I mean, it looks like he'd never had a glove laid on him. He's, He's almost as pretty as you. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we both have great faces for radio. <laughs> yeah, he was, and it really, it was a true story. During the 80s, whenever we had anything that had anything to do with kids, and this is when he was in the heyday of his career, he would always show up, he'd always be there wherever we needed it. Um, just a special person who's dedicated his life to kids and to, to people less fortunate than he's been. And it'll be, uh, it'll be a Pretty special day tomorrow, and I'm, I'm sure he's going to get a little emotional. I mean, he just kind of touched on it today, but when he introduces Muhammad Ali tomorrow at the luncheon, it, it will, I'm sure, be a very special moment. Here's Paul Yanish 0 for 2, trying to get a, another run in for the Reds. If you're just joining us. White Sox took a 2 0 lead on a two run home run by Chris Getz, his first major league home run. Reds got a run back in the fourth on back to back doubles by Nixon Hernandez. The Reds here in the sixth. Single by Harrison, homer by Phillips. Have taken a 3 to 2 lead and they've got two on with two outs. Well, Paul Yadis kind of forced into action at the very last moment tonight. That's when Alice Gonzalez came up with a lame arm. He had a little sore elbow, so Dusty Baker decided to scratch him right at 7 o'clock. Paul oh, Giannis, even in the month of June, he's only had one game in June where he's had four at bats. He's been riding that pine just about every day here in June. And even you go back into the month of May, he only had four or five games in which he started and got more than one at bats. It's kind of tough to come in there and hope that he does anything at all, but whatever he can do right here will help the Reds cause. Three balls, two strikes, two outs. Runners will be off and scampering. There they go, and it's fouled off. You figure either way, this will probably be Contreras' last inning. He went eight innings his last two times, but just over 100 pitches. 32 pitches this inning. Now 99 pitches for the night for Contreras. You know what? I don't think he ever knew what a pitch count was until, yeah. until he came over to the New York Yankees. He was like 140, 150. Every I mean, time. I'm, I'm saying back in the days in Cuba, who knows how many he was throwing over there. Bounce it down to third. Beckham backs up, but gets it over there in time. It almost squirted away from Beckham. Well, it's a night for baseball, but the civil rights game also is a night in the weekend for boxing. Muhammad Ali honored tomorrow. Bronson Arroyo 
early going, had his strikeout pitch working. He struck out three in the first two innings. And then he was finally dented for a home run after a walk to Castro with two outs in the fourth. Chris Getz hits his first career home run, and the White Sox led it by a score of two to nothing. Then at the bottom of the fourth, Nick's doubled, and then Ramon Hernandez doubled to get the Reds on the board. It was two to one. In the sixth, a leadoff base hit from Jerry Harrison Jr. and Brandon Phillips hits his 11th homer, and the Reds lead it three to two, and that's where we are. Arroyo still in there now with a lead. Three runs, nine hits for the Reds. Two runs, only two hits. For the White Sox and an error. And Bronson, Chris, as you said it early, he knew coming in he couldn't give up a lot, and so far he's got a one run lead. Well, he hasn't given up hardly anything at all, George. Only two runs on two hits. Of course, the one pitch he'd like to have back is the one little hanging breaking ball that he threw to this young man, Chris Getz. That was really the only lazy pitch he threw of the night. Really didn't finish that breaking ball, kind of threw it up there flat, and Getz hit it just right to get his first home run. Gets bounced out, robbed of a hit on a diving stab by the second baseman Brandon Phillips in the second, and then his first major league homer in the fourth. Gets Anderson and Beckham do up, and there's a leadoff wall. Third walk allowed by Bronson. Here comes Brian Anderson, and here comes our Firestone leaderboard. Team ERA leaders in Major League Baseball. The Dodgers, who have been brilliant, are number one. The Mariners, who have surprisingly had a brilliant year. And then who's behind that? The Reds, sixth overall. And the White Sox are eighth. You thought of the White Sox as a big power team, and you wondered if the pitching would hold out. Well, the Reds and the White Sox are very similar. They've had strong starting pitching and outstanding bullpen play. Here's Anderson looking somewhat uncomfortable trying to drop down a sacrifice. Great to have you with us, George Grand, Chris Welch, Jim Day, Jeff Bacora will be by with Reds Live post game down in the truck. You just saw those highlights put together by Matt Sigafoos, our producer Christian Roberts, our director Brian Hunterman, Lauren White down in the truck as well. And we are blessed tonight, Chris. John Brody's back in the truck again. But he's got that orange man outfit on too, George. Just can't get away from it. Can't pry himself away from Syracuse Orange. Syracuse Lacrosse. One ball, one strike to Anderson, who flied out, popped up 0 for 2. Anderson has a couple of sacrifices on the year. One thing that may make him feel uncomfortable is that good breaking ball that Arroyo fires in there. Both pitchers over a hundred. is a guy George that gives the White Sox tremendous defense. He's got a great arm. He's a very aggressive outfielder. He gets the ball off the walls and in the gaps. But at 27 years old it's about time in their opinion that he begins to show them what he can do offensively. This year and in all the years combined he's a 225 lifetime hitter. That will only get you so far. Here goes the runner. Fly ball into center field. It'll stay in the park. Dickerson at the warning track hauls it in. Back to first goes Getz. One out, one on. Here comes Beckham. Bowl for two. Fly ball out and a ground out. You, know, you scared me for a while there with Sugar Ray. When you put your hands up, I thought he was going to floor you. You know, right I, I forgot about the boxing instinct. I mean, I could have been. Doubled over and over the edge of the booth here, George, and so quickly even you couldn't have saved me. Man, he he reacted fast. Yeah, my didn't back. He? Didn't he? I did, I did. I was running as soon as I saw your back. <laughs> Jesse was there for us, so. though. Here's Beckham, 0 for two. I can't believe he's 50 years old. Yeah. I mean, he just looks like he still looks like he. 
And remember, he's a boxer, yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's like the Dick Clark of boxing. He, he never changed. Man. But boy, is he, uh, has he given of himself over these years? He had some battles with Hearns and Hagler. Oh. There goes the runner. Here comes the throw. It's going to be high, and they won't get him. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> he took it easy on you. <laughs> one ball, one strike, the tying run now in scoring position. Well, the White Sox have picked the right times to run tonight, and they have run very successfully against this Reds ball club. Really ironic, too, because the White Sox have the worst by a long shot stolen base defense in all of baseball. Opposing teams against the White Sox are successful 96% of the time they steal. A.J. Pierzynski has thrown out one guy and allowed 38 to steal, and the rest of the White Sox catching staff hasn't done a whole lot better. They've only thrown out two out of 49. The Reds are really a, among the league leaders in the National League in shutting down the running game. But tonight, the White Sox have pitched, picked the right time. And Arroyo, despite what he has done in the past, has given up some stolen bases this evening. He's pitching with runners in scoring position. Brzezinski will be in there tomorrow. Breaking ball outside. Two balls, two strikes to Beckham. American League, you're in there for your offense to start, no doubt. And they picked the people you would expect to run. I mean, Pacetnik, Ramirez, and Getz are the three that have stolen base capability, and all three of them have stolen a base tonight. Yeah, they've all had just about the same number of stolen bases. Big out right there. Good job by Bronson. Second out of the inning, he gets Beckham. Well, Beckham is struggling, no question about that. A buck 75 is what he's hitting. He's a young man that we've talked about, having been drafted last year in the spot right behind Yonder Alonso. They rush him to the major leagues, and he's obviously struggling offensively. Well, you knew you were going to see him, and up in the bullpen for the Reds, loosening has been Arthur Rhodes, and Jim Tomei being announced here to pinch hit for Contreras. Tomei, and of course, the big home run threat off the bench without the designated hitter rule. He was not in the starting lineup, so he's going to be called upon to pinch hit, and Dusty Baker will make his move. Double switch. Arthur Rhodes will be on his way in to face Tome when we return. Our Skyline Chili call to the bullpen takes us to break.
Still a game and a half over St. Louis, three and a half ahead of the Reds in the Central Division. Changes. Adam Rosales will enter the game. Rosales enters at third. That means from third to short goes Jerry Harrison Jr. And here's your matchup, Chris. You have a guy that you know you want to pitch against somebody else when you start the game, and here's the matchup that Dusty Baker wanted. Well, one thing Dusty Baker does every night himself is his matchup card. He knows what pitchers have done against hitters, and he knows quite well right here these numbers, which are astounding. Rhodes versus Jim Tomei. How about two for 21 with 12 punch outs? Tomei really didn't think he was going to get to face Arroyo, did he? He did. In fact, uh, it was oh he did he thought he would face Rhodes you're right and because when the, the game started when they were stretching on the field Arthur Rhodes came over to say hello to a couple of the teammates told me one of them on the other side of the field and Jim said I'll see you later tonight. <laughs> he expected this one ball one strike. Tome figures to get only one at bat tonight. He represents the go ahead run tying run at second. What a career, Chris. 38 years of age, last year of his contract. Active home run leaders, he's sitting on 553. That's a lot of home runs, George, but my most lasting memory of Jim Tomei is him fielding ground balls, Buddy Bell hitting them ground balls in spring training down there at third base saying, man, this kid right. can hit. We got to find him a place to play. At Winter Haven. Yeah. We saw him at Winter Haven. Exactly that day. right. Yep. In fact, Buddy Bell is here somewhere tonight, from what I understand. Of course, he's the minor league director of uh, personnel uh, for the White Sox. Two balls, two strikes to Tomei. Last year, 34 homers, 90 knocked in. Well, trying to come inside on him right there, and. That ball tailing the other way. Rhodes has a four seamer that kind of cuts away from a left hander. That one stayed straight. 3 2. Popped up left side. Back goes Rosales. In comes Nix. Nix calling him off in foul territory. They get Tome. Good job by Arthur. He keeps his record intact against Tome. The Reds still lead it 3 2, going to the bottom of seven. Park, very festive weekend and a very meaningful weekend that continues tomorrow at the Duke Energy Center at 11 a.m. with a luncheon. President Bill Clinton, former President Clinton, will be the keynote speaker. Bill Crosby, 
Henry Aaron, Muhammad Ali will be honored. We had a chance to visit with Sugar Ray Leonard earlier, who will introduce Muhammad Ali. And it'll be a very special, special day, and it'll continue here at the ballpark tomorrow night with pregame ceremonies honoring America and the battle for civil rights. Here's Octavio Dotel, who will take over for Contreras. So Contreras allows three runs on nine hits. Exits trailing three to two. Here's Rosales hitting in the ninth spot, popping it up. Canerco there got it, one away. Here comes Chris Dickerson. He got the Reds rolling in the first. Had a bunt hit, and when Beckham threw the ball away, went to second. He was sacrificed to second by Jerry Harrison Jr., but neither Phillips nor Nix could get him in in that first inning rally. Second time up, he bounced to second. Third time up, he lined to right. That came with Hannigan on third. Rifle left center, heading to the warning track. It's going to be one hop off the wall, cruising into second. With a two base hit is Chris Dickerson. His fifth double of the season, and the Reds have a one out runner in scoring position. And he's had a pretty nice night tonight. He had a little bleeder that was turned into a triple essentially when he was able to, or into second base when he was able to get the, the third baseman to throw a wild. And this one he rifles big time. And this is what is so intriguing about Chris Dickerson. When he centers the ball, he is one strong player and a very good athlete. And he finds himself on second base with one out. So Dotel peeking over his shoulder, looking at Dickerson at second, will deal to Harrison. Harrison successfully sacrificed first time up. Thrown out by the shortstop Ramirez in the fourth, and then singled in the sixth inning. His single to left was followed by the Brandon Phillips homer that gave the Reds a three to two lead. Loosening in the bullpen for Cincinnati. Chris Dotel is one of those intriguing stories. When he first came up, it looked like he was the big time closer to be in Houston. In fact, it was his emergence that allowed them to let Billy Wagner exit. Arm troubles since have sidetracked him, but his velocity started to come back up, and he's always tantalized you as a guy that could dominate at the end of a game. Yeah, and that's the, he had the stuff that would dominate. I mean, he had a fastball when he was back there with the Astros, George. You remember in the mid to high 90s. There goes Dickerson. It's fouled off into the seats. And the thing about Dotel is that he kind of throws the ball where it would come right out of his shirt. It was very difficult to pick up. He no longer has that mid 90s fastball, but he's still having a pretty good run of it here in his 11th major league season. League batting against him in the low 200s. Dotel peers in for a sign. Castro delivers Dickerson off second one ball two strikes. And he's a former closer he's had as many as 36 saves in a season. Say it's about the third year that he was with the Astros, Dotel. 2002. What a year he had. He had an earned run average at the end of the year about 1.8. He struck out 118 batters in 97 innings. I mean, it was a mismatch when they brought this young man in. Now 36 years, 35 years old, it'll be 36 in November. One and 
two. Harrison hanging in there with Phillips on deck. Hey, Reds fans, for a great tasting quality meal for your family, pick up a bag of JTM beef or chicken Philly cheesesteaks from your favorite grocer. JTM food, family, fun. Food, family, fun at the ballpark tonight included up here in the our box Penn Station subs before the game got everybody ready for tonight's ball game. Thanks to all the folks down at Penn Station for a, another night of a great pregame meal. I think we're undefeated with Penn Station middles. So we got to keep it what, going. They were absolutely delicious yours. They were so good. I had two only. I sampled the chicken, then sampled the steak. That's it. How else do you find out? I can't decide which one. I'm going to have to ask for some more. Try a couple more. Two balls, two strikes. Foul again. Great at bat by Harrison. Hanging tough as Dotel keeps pouring in on him. The next delivery will be the ninth of this at bat. Again has finally gotten the message. He's waving gets over to try to keep Dickerson close at second. Dickerson has gotten a big lead each of the previous pitches, and now gets is over that opens a pretty good hole on the right side for Hairston. And he goes that way. Looped into right. That's a base hit. Here comes Dickerson. They're gonna hold him. Die, who has led the American League in assists from right, has a very accurate arm. So alertly. Barry holds him after he's two steps past the third base bag. Uh, Dickerson got a very bad jump right there. In fact, he must not have checked where the outfielders were. Either that or just misread the ball coming off the bat, Tony, because he freezes right there. It actually starts to go back. If you check your outfielders after every pitch, you'll know where that guy is, and you'll know right away that that ball is going to be a base hit. But with one out, he gets the third base, and that's the important thing right here. Brandon Phillips, who's done the most damage on the night, has got a chance to break this one open. Great at bat by Jerry Harrison Jr. to finally work a base hit to the right side. Here's Brandon bounced out twice. Then Homer is 11th of the year in the sixth inning down the left field line. That gave the Reds a 3 2 lead. In the air to left. This is going to stay in the park. But Sednick, not a great arm. Tagging at third is Dickerson. The throw will come into second. They'll hold him there. Sacrifice fly from Brandon Phillips. Three runs batted in on the night. The Reds lead it four to two. Well, what Brandon could not get done back in the first inning, grounded out the second baseman, is able to do here in the seventh inning. And that's going to fall into the outfield to score Dickerson from third base. And now a two run cushion for the Reds. You know what he's saying, Chris? I just missed that. He hit that a mile in the air, but straight up. If he had any direction on it, it would have been a second decker. Here's Nix. There goes the runner. Here comes the throw. Not in time. A stolen base for Jerry Harrison Jr. Here's the fifth bag for Harrison. Yeah, and, Do and Dotel is getting scolded now by the catcher Ramon Castro for not even paying attention to Jerry Harrison down there. They didn't give Castro a chance at all to get Jerry Harrison. And very alert base running by Harrison, realizing that Dotel is not even thinking about him, and he took a big lead and ran rampant. It was strike one to Knicks. And Chris, when Dotel threw 97-98, I mean, he never held runners on when he was in Houston. But you didn't worry about it that much. Where he is now, and especially in the role that he's in, and basically a setup or middle role, you've got to be able to hold runners. Or at least pay attention to him. One ball, one strike. Getz has it. And that'll do it. But the Reds do some business. A double, a single, and a sacrifice fly. Reds play add on, lead at 4 2, going to the eighth.
Great to have you with us back at Great American Ballpark. George Grand, Chris Welch, Jesse Jackson up in the booth. Don't forget Jim Day, Jeff Pecoro coming by for Reds Live post game after today's ball game. Four runs, 11 hits for Cincinnati. No errors, six left. Two runs, two hits, and an error for the White Sox. Four left on base. First pitch swinging. The leadoff hitter, Scott Pitsednik, guys at the center. Dickerson's got it, and there's one away. Pitsednik tonight walked in the first, left stranded. Doubled in the third with two outs, left stranded. Bounced to second, and this fly ball to center. Well, Arthur Rhodes gets Pitsednik to start the inning with Ramirez coming up. Dusty will go back to the bullpen, and while a pitching change takes place, we'll take time out for these messages. You're watching Reds Baseball on Fox Sports Ohio. has been pretty cool tonight. Bronson Arroyo six and two thirds inning two hit baseball and a couple of runs seven strikeouts three walks the bullpen so far so good. Here's David Weathers to come in and face the right hander Alexei Ramirez. Well for David Weathers appearance number nine hundred and twenty four twenty eight of them this year and he's been pretty good. That combination that Dusty Baker has at his disposal down towards the end of the ball game. Massett Rhodes Weathers and then Cordero. Lights out for the most part. 924 is good for 19th all time. He's now only seven behind Gene Garber for 18th all time. Jesse Orozco, of course, number one with over 1,200. Ramirez struck out and lined out, walked and stole a base in the sixth. Talk about hitting with runners in scoring position, but pitching with runners in scoring position, Chris, is sometimes overlooked. How do you bear down when you're in those critical situations? And the Reds have done that tonight. Well, you try to slow the game down, George. That's the most important thing, hitters and pitchers alike. But, you know, the key is not to give in. Go with your best stuff and simply not give in if you happen to be behind on the count. You know, Ray Miller, who was a great pitching coach for the Baltimore Orioles, and then later on in his career, a manager used to have a, a saying for his pitchers in tough jams. He'd say, What's your favorite pitch? And he'd tell him, He says, All right, take a little bit off that pitch and throw it for a strike. It's amazing how often that would work. Bouncer to short, Harrison gets the speedy Ramirez two away. Ramirez in the six walked to lead off the inning then stole a base so he was on second and then Jermaine Dye struck out Conurco struck out 
and Castro lined out. That was against Bronson Arroyo. Arroyo did what he needed to do with a runner in scoring position in the sixth. At that point, a one-run ball game, three to three to two. The Weathers trying to get die here. Jermaine struck out, bounced out, struck out. Harriston scoops it up. Off balance throw. Nicely done, Jerry Harriston Jr. David Weathers gets two ground balls. That's good enough. To the bottom of eight we go. Hernandez, Bruce, and Hannigan do up. Good defense. How about this play from the Rawlings Gold Glove winner, Brandon Phillips? He robs Chris Getz of a potential base hit. It was a dandy play, Chris. Well, you're not kidding about that, George. You, but we're so used to seeing Brandon Phillips do this. We've raised the bar of expectation to the point where anything's hit to the right side, you expect him to gobble it up. That's not easy. He just makes it look easy. Our John Morrell hot dog play of the game. And he's also delivered a two run homer and a sacrifice fly. Helped to spur the Reds to a lead of four to two. Chatting with Eric Davis. Great to have E.D. with the Reds this week on this homestand. Came around at the right time. He's in his own way, Chris. You know, you talk about leadership. And when he was a player, he was obviously an outstanding all star caliber player. But he led in little ways by little conversations that he had with players on an everyday basis. And he's been doing that this week, too. Here's Dwayne Wise, former Red for a period of time. He's coming in in right field. He'll hit in the ninth spot. And the new pitcher will be the left-hander, Aaron Pareda, who will take over. Well, he's a former number one draft pick a couple of years ago. In the 2007, they picked Pareda, a big guy, six feet, six inch left-hander, 240 pounds out of the University of San Francisco. Just his second game. And they say this young man can get it up there right now. I mean, right now. And he doesn't always have the right zip code. But he's not afraid to let it rip. Made his major league debut just this past week at Milwaukee, throwing an inning and two thirds of scoreless baseball. Came up from Birmingham the first week of June down in Birmingham. 69 strikeouts and 11 starts with the Barons. And an overall 5 and 4 record. Led the Southern League in strikeouts when he was called up. First round, two years ago, 2007 draft out of the University of San Francisco. Look out. 
This will wake you up a little, huh? glance off of him and that ball hit him square ouch he looks a little raw out there Parada does so Hernandez down at first Parada will work from the stretch and here comes Jay Bruce Bruce showing butt pushes it down the third baseline but foul trying to play add on lead off batter on here in the eighth inning Bruce tonight Bounced into a double play, struck out, and lined the right. Hope you join us tomorrow. Johnny Cueto against Clayton Richards, who started off outstandingly. We're on the air for the Reds live at 6.30. It's the Civil Rights game, of course, will include a pregame festivities, which will bring you. We'll zero in on this weekend and what it means. We've talked about some of the features we'll have. We'll hear from Dusty Baker. We'll hear from those dignitaries who are here in town and at the ballpark. Features including the one we talked about with Jerry Harrison Jr. and his family. Chronicle the history of the civil rights movement and its relationship to the Reds in baseball. All of that tomorrow and more. So we hope you join us. Feature on the Freedom Center, the Underground Railroad, the great Chuck Harmon, who we always enjoy visiting with. Chris will get his great reflections on his time with the Reds and what the movement has meant to him. Two balls, two strikes. There's some guys that you. Every time you see you automatically get a smile on your face. We talked about it when we were in Kansas City. Buck O'Neill was one of those. And Chuck Harmon is another. No doubt about that. Get hard down to second. Four to six. The three double play. Bruce bangs into his second double play of the evening. So he's got an 0 for 4. And here comes Hannigan with two outs. Just to give you an idea of what will go on tomorrow, we'll go on with the Reds Live at 6.30. And we'll have the Beacon Award ceremony at the tail end of Reds Live, live on the field. B.B. Winans will perform America. Hank Aaron, Muhammad Ali, Bill Cosby will receive their awards. It will be given to them during the day at a luncheon at the Duke Energy Center. And by the way, that game is now officially a sellout. So the game is a sellout. But... You can see all the action right here on Fox Sports Ohio tomorrow night. And then when it's all over, we'll have a ring set up at second base and Sugar Ray Leonard and Chris Welch will go after it. <laughs> You're going to be my ring man, right, George? I will. I'll be your cut man. You're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for the vote of confidence. <laughs> Never put your hands up to a boxer, right? <laughs> That was great. He was a joy to be with, wasn't he? Oh, he's a wonderful guy. <laughs> Glenn sure Ball glad he had a sense of humor. Yep. <laughs> he does, too. <laughs> Sugar Ray tonight will address the crowd here. He does a tremendous job of inspirationally speaking to small groups and even large groups. And he'll treat the fans here when the game is over. We got fireworks coming too. Not a lot of fireworks, but for a team that's been offensively challenged of late, 11 hits on the board looks pretty good for the Reds. Four runs, 11 hits, and yes, a home run tonight. It was from Brandon Phillips. That's wide for a ball. So a hit batter in a walk and Brandon Phillips has delivered the homer on this night but Pareda here in the eighth even though he's given up a hit batter in a walk the double play has gotten them out of major trouble so far. 
And with Arthur Rhodes due up in the eighth spot, Michael Owings will come in to pinch hit. And he gets deservedly a nice round of applause. He not only pitched well against Atlanta, he hit well against Atlanta. Well, the Reds only had four hits in the entire ball game. He had the big one, a three-run homer to right center field. Fouled off his foot, strike one. Comes in at 278. That homer was his second of the year. Now seven runs batted in. Also got three doubles and a triple. So ten hits, three doubles, a triple, and two homers. It's a pretty good slugging percentage. Ramirez. John Herspeck said they got him by the slimmest of margins. <laughs> and the fans don't like it. But we're going to the ninth inning. The Reds have a 4-2 lead. You can vote for one by going to foxsports.com and clicking on the link for all stars among us. The winner from each major league city will be honored before the all star game on July the 14th, seen only on Fox. So cast your ballot. These are just three, but every one of us in our own community knows there's so many people that do so much to make this great land of ours even better. And that's what. You have the chance to vote for and have the chance to participate in this weekend on this Civil Rights Weekend here at Great American Ballpark. Here we go to the ninth inning, last roundup time for the White Sox. And here comes Coco. Well, he's got a two run lead to protect. Francisco Cordero does. The White Sox have been simply shellacked by Reds pitching on the day. Bronson Arroyo gave up the two hits that you see right there. Six and two thirds innings of two hit two run baseball. Arthur Rhodes has come in and done a nice job. David Weathers and now turning it over to Francisco Cordero game number 30 looking for save number 17. That's a big bullet to left. That's going to be long gone. Paul Canerco connects for his ninth homer of the year and his 998th career run batted in. That's a leadoff homer here in the ninth.
lifetime coming in against him. And boy, he looked for a first pitch fastball, and that's exactly what he got. Well, Canerco, one run batted in away from a thousand for his career, and that home run was his 300th as a Chicago White Sox player. Of course, his career started in Los Angeles with the Dodgers and then on to Cincinnati. Swing and a miss for A.J. Pruszynski, who comes in to pinch it for Castro. So that run, Chris, that sometimes seems meaningless, the extra sacrifice fly by Brandon Phillips now looms even bigger for Coco Cordero. Well, they're not meaningless if you're uh, Dusty Baker. Pruszynski fouls it off his foot. A.J. in his career, old. A one for three against Cordero. And there was a no doubter from Canerco that was over 400 feet. Still nobody out. Two strikes on Pierzynski. His foot again. Well, he is just pounding that low inside part of the strike zone, and Pierzynski's hitting the same spot. He swing. Well, those sliders down and in, those are meant for that. You get the night off as Brzezinski did. Don't have the catch. You figure I won't take a couple of bumps and bruises. And in two swings, he chops away at his ankle and his foot. That's right down the middle. A little giddy up at 97 miles an hour, huh? Well, you know, I think that home run by Canerco may have woken, awakened anyway, Francisco Cordero a little bit. He reaches back for something extra. Brzezinski has something to say to the home plate umpire Chad Fairchild as he walks by. But that looked like it had the inside corner. Strike out for Cordero, one out, and here comes the second baseman gets standing right on the line is the first baseman Ramon Hernandez. That goes foul and past him. Well, they're protecting the line at first, but Adam Rosales at third base, nowhere near the line. Figuring that Getz is going to be able to pull that ball. A lot of room down there. First strike 0 and 2. You saw the numbers on Cordero, his 30th game. 227 career saves. That's 30th on the all time list. 100 saves in both leagues. Not many have done that. Only 11 pitchers in the history of the majors have accomplished that feat. Two outs away from another one here. Two strikes. Looks like he's waving at the wind, huh? But well, Cordero not messing around. He may have thrown one good get ahead fastball that was rocketed out of here by Paul Cronurco, but he's taking no chances now. He is bearing down and bringing some cheese. Here's Brian Anderson, and they're on their feet. We'll let the crowd take you through this at bat. One out away from a win.
The strikes get the cheers. The balls get the eyes. Anderson tonight fly to center popped up fly to center. side a base hit that'll keep the White Sox alive here in the night so Anderson gets his first hit of the night a base hit to left and that'll bring up the rookie Gordon Beckham hitting in the eighth spot Beckham tonight 0 for 3 fly it out grounded out and struck out. See a couple of those 96, 97. You gear up for that, and there's the slider drop out. Yeah, but a slider, and it wasn't a very good one. Beckham kind of dropped his hands in the bat and said, "Man, I miss swinging at a pretty good one right there, a hanger." He won't get another one of those. That wasn't just a throw over, was it? He almost picked him. Good thing there was a catcher <laughs> over there. He threw that about 97 to first base. <laughs> No balls, one strike. Beckham digs in. Cordero to the stretch. Coco celebrates. The Reds take game one and end a nine-game losing streak against the White Sox as Dusty Baker takes home a victory. For Baker, the 1,270th of his career, as Brandon Phillips two-run homer and a sacrifice fly, giving three runs batted in. The last one was the key, as the Reds hold on for a 4-3 victory in the lid lifter of this series. A royal.